It's WICR. Hey, dude. And we're back. Uh, when during during the break, I was um looking back on the um old shows or, or or the old show I did last week, and I realized that um I didn't finish talking about my favorite show in the world. And if you follow me on Twitter, or um are friends with me on Facebook, it it's not My Little Pony. No, it's a <laughs> and that's well it's, believe me, the close second. But my favorite show is Doctor Who. Now, we will get to you with foreign policy in a bit, right after this, because I love Doctor Who. And um, the people running it don't know what they're doing. <laughs> they have no idea what they're doing. They're morons. Now, le now, let me first say this, okay? Stephen Moffat, I like you. You know, you wrote Coupling. You wrote probably the man Russell T. Davis as ever, the greatest Doctor Who episode of at least a new era. At least a new era. Sorry about that. At least a new era. You know, in Doctor Who. But under your tenure, you know, we were happy, Morphat. We were generally happy that Stephen Morphat took the reins of Doctor Who. Under RTD, too many Us uh, episodes, too many Love Gooey, you know. You know, it's not Doctor Who, you know. It's more like Buffy or some American love, you know, teenage drama. But not Doctor Who, you know. You know, of course, RTD. Russell T. Davis brought Doctor Who back from like 20 some odd years. The movie, eh, you know. Other than Paul McGann, we, we really don't talk about the movie that much. And other and other than the, looking at Grace Holloway and watch Paul McGann's acting, the movie, you know, could go in the trash. Sorry. But, yeah. But, you know, we were so happy. At, and after season five, we were, you know, filled with joy saying, oh, great, hey, you know, what a great season five, you know, probably the best season in a new era of Doctor Who. And then, and then, I can't even talk about it, be honest. Season, series six. What? Full, that was, that, that series was just garbage. The whole season was a cop-out. And we were like, by the end of the season, we were all like, what? What is this? You know, this, you know, what? I wasted like a year of my life watching this for that? That's the way they ended it? I couldn't believe it. But that, I, I was so aggravated. I was like, ugh, you know? And then, and then we got that crappy Christmas special. The doctor, whatever, in the wardrobe. I didn't, I, you know, I was like, wow. In season, in season two, there was an episode of Doctor Who called Love and Monsters. That episode has been beaten by that one. That, at that moment, I was like, you know what? Morphette, you have to go. Sorry, you gotta go. And then, <laughs> season, season 7 comes out. Season 7 of Doctor Who. Again, not a full season, because half of it is devoted to two old companions, who in season 6, their story was over, they were gone, he, he brings them back, Amy Pond and Rory, and they're there for seven, six, seven episodes, and then they leave. And I'm like, you, you, their story is over. I don't want to see them anymore. And he brings them back for half a year just to fill his ego because Rose, the first companion in the new series, had a record of longest Doctor Who companion, and now Amy Pond does. And then he kills... Half the season, riding his way through the ending of part two. Now, other than looking at Clara and seeing Matt Smith, you know, be the puppet of Morphette as Doctor Who, there was nothing really enjoyable about the, about the season. They gave away the big closing ending in the trailer right before the week before the episode. It was we were like, ah, oh. and then the fiftieth anniversary. My God. What a disappointment that was. More, it was more like the eighth year anniversary. Except for Tom Baker. The guy ruined the Zygons. You know. It was it was trash. It really was. That At that moment. I liked it. Because going into it. My expectations were so low. Anything he would have done. Which he. You know. He did, he did pretty much nothing. He, you, know, he, you know. He put in a couple of pictures here and there. 
But, you know, I, I was like, yeah, but watching it again, I was like, you know what? This sucks. This is garbage. You know, we could do better than that. I could do better than that. I'm not even a writer. Yet. Anyway, you know, who knows what the future holds. But yeah, my goodness me. Golly. What a horrible Christmas, I mean, 50th anniversary. It, well, I call it the 8th anniversary because, you know, that would, you know, there was no, other than Tom Baker, there was no really classic references except for the intro, which is nice. And, um, yeah, that was it, you know. And they had the nerve to go back to the Coal Hill School. That was where, the, you know, that was where the first episode of Doctor Who took place. That's where the first two companions, Ian and Barbara, met the doc, you know, went on to go meet the doctor. And they, and, and, and on the wall says, um, headmaster or principal, Ian Chesterton. Why not just have the actors there, you know? And, and, and right, right, after that, and right after that, we go to Clara, who's teaching in the classroom, and we have some stranger, some typical kid, give her a letter for the doctor. I'm like, is this is the 50th anniversary. If, if this is the, you know, crap going to feed us, have Ian give her the letter, you know? That would be, be nice. If he, if that was there, if Ian gave it a letter to some some, no, some nobody kid who never, who never saw it again, by the way, then, you know, ah, oh, I was just like, ah, oh, you know, I didn't know what to do. I I bought the DVD just to have it. I'm more than noble because, you know what, what yeah, whatever. But, you know, he killed the Zygons. You know, if that's the thing, you know, you know what I'm talking about. And yet, fans who don't even bother to watch, who don't even bother to watch the classic episodes, Love this guy. He goes, yeah, more about the greatest thing in, in, in history happened to Doctor Who. He's not. Sorry. And David Tennant is not the best Doctor Who either. It's Tom Baker, by the way. Tom is number one. And nobody, except for McGann, clumps close to Tom Baker as Doctor Who. Okay? Sorry, fangirls out there. David Tennant is not numero uno. He's probably bottom five. Yeah, so, you know, this season, we have a new Doctor, Peter Capaldi. Who I love, him, you know, a Doctor Who, by the way. He's awesome. Uh, yeah, so he's awesome. His acting's brilliant. Clara, the companion, still has no character, even though they're trying to give her one. And they're bombing at it. So, you know, we had season, season 5, you know, good, not great. Season 6, sucked. Season 7, arguably was worse. And now you have season 8. And the first three episodes were like, yes! Now, come, now this, is, this is Doctor Who now. This is the Doctor Who of Tom Baker, William Hartnell, Patrick Troughton, Sylvester McCoy, John Pertwee, and at times Colin Baker, even though we hide that, and Peter Davidson too, I forgot about him. So you, we were like, yes, okay. And then we have an episode called Listen, and it was like, it was a very divided episode, divisive episode among the fan base. I hated the episode. I thought it was the worst episode since, you know, the, you know, ever, to be honest with you, it was garbage, that episode. And then the next two were, you know, okay, you know, nothing special, but, you know, you know, fives and sixes, fine. And now this episode was awesome. The doctor left Clara on the moon to die. And I was like, yes, kill Clara off. You know, you had a, you had a chance to kill, now again, Dr. Hoofus would know this. You had a chance to kill Rose off. Brilliant. And they didn't do it. Instead, she's stuck on some ultimate planet somewhere. Like, God, what, you know, just kill her off. The panties in Doctor Who died all the time. Agent died in a spaceship with the Cybermen. Katrina died against the Daleks. Perry, quote unquote, died, even though they brought her back, you know. But not really bring her, you know. Even though they said, oh no, she's not dead, she's alive somewhere. And I'm like, okay, cool, you know. But Perry died. In my mind, she's dead, because, you know, that was just for the children, probably. Saying, oh no, Perry's alive. And that, and probably for the guys who all they did was look at a at, at a figure, because you know, if you type in Perry Doctor Who, you'll see you'll see what I mean. But yeah, and again, David Tennant and Matt Smith are nowhere near the greatest Doctor Who of all time. Sorry, it goes to Tom Baker, John Pertwee, at times McCoy, McGann. If you watch, if, if you listen to the audio dramas, and Troughton, those are my Doctor Who's, not this. Poop that's showing out there now, you know. This is this isn't Doctor Who. It's something else, you know. It's bad. Sorry, Capaldi is the only reason I'm still watching the show. And he's brilliant at Doctor. He's a good actor. 
you know? And, and, and I love now they have the doctor who has a dog, you know? He's not that tomboy, pretty boy anymore. He's a dog, ruthless man almost. And I'm like, yeah, you know, that's my doctor now. That's Hartnell. That's Colin Baker when he was, you know, in his good episode. That's McCoy against Ace. Or with Ace. This is brilliant what they're doing right now. And I love this completely. And this is, you know, this is what I wanted. And, and, and that was the first three episodes. And the last one to a certain extent. Now, if you're going to watch Doctor Who, please watch the classic episodes. Because you are not a Doctor Who fan, truly, unless you watch at least five classic episodes. Come on, people. Okay? All you new Doctor Who fans out there. You watch New Who like it's, you know, like drinking water. Well, as you should drink water. This is trash. Okay, watch the classic stuff. Watch Tom Baker. Tom Baker's Doctor Who, in my mind. And in a lot of people's mind, too. He's the best Doctor Who. And he is the best Doctor Who. I don't care what you people say. It's not David Tennant. David Tennant is good, but he's not Tom Baker. Why do I want to see Doctor Who cry all the time? Doctor Who doesn't cry. He's an alien. He's not human. Matt Smith. He's a five-year-old. Anyway, you know. Uh... I'm sure all the one Whovian or any Whovian to listen to this don't care. You're probably a Nuvian, probably a more fat fan. I don't like you probably, and you know that's about it for Doctor Who. Again, watch Doctor Who on Saturdays, nine o'clock on BBC America. You can watch a pre- uh, and, and at eight o'clock you can watch last week's episode, which was okay, nothing special, and you know the science was wrong because they made. You know, I'm not gonna get into that. Watch my YouTube videos for that. Yeah. My YouTube channel is um, Nicholas the Brovian on YouTube. So, you know, I make Doctor Who videos. I'm giving myself a plug right there. There's my plug. Nicholas the Brovian YouTube to get my Doctor Who reviews. And again, Tom Baker is Doctor Who. I don't care what you say. Nobody be, nobody's even close to Tom Baker's superiority as Doctor Who. Uh, so enough with Doctor Who. Let's talk about our presidents and, our, and their foreign policy, which has been a disaster, as um, Estevan said in Zeg and Cody. For some reason, this country butts, his, butts our nose, or puts our nose in places it doesn't belong. <laughs> you know, we've had from from Bush, Clinton, Bush, and now Obama on. You know, for some reason, we, we're in a globalist mentality, you know. And I'm like, you know, I care about America first. Now, I care about other people, you know, people in Africa, whatever, blah, 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 blah. But I care about this country first, you know? I want people to have jobs in this country first. And for some reason, it is a shame to say... Now, before I go on, you know, I know many of you, if I could have said Obama, many of you would go, oh, a Bush did this, Bush did that. And that's true. But when I criticize Obama, and when most, and, and when most people criticize Obama, we are not defending the Bush administration. And many Democrats and liberals must understand that a, that criticizing Obama is not, and I mean is not, a defense of George W. Bush. It's not. Sorry, you know, you might live. In, you know, you know. I'm sure Fox News does that, but I'm not gonna do that. I I don't like the Bush administration. I hate it. It was one of the reasons why, you know, I hate George Bush. I don't like Obama either. I don't like Clinton either. I don't like Bush the father either. I like Reagan somewhat, not completely, but, you know, he's better than any of those four people combined anyway. So, yeah. So, yeah. But it is a shame, and it is, and it is really, really sad to see companies put profit above their country. It is a tragedy, and it should not be still going on. This is, this is a real crime. Now, for many of you, people say, oh, Obama's for the working class. Is he really? Look at who's his friend, though. He hangs up with Bill Gates. He ain't that monster's vineyard with all those billionaires who outsource our jobs to other countries. Is Obama really for you? What kind of moron are you believing that crap? You know, Obama, Obama spends with millionaires. Obama, you know, GE had a GE. He spends with them too. You know, how, how naive are you people? Is Obama really for the working class? No. Are the Republicans as they are right now? Now again, as they are right now for the majority... The ones that are in Washington, are they really for the working class? The answer's probably not either. But you know what? This is why, you know, if you're, if you're into politics, reform both parties. Because quite frankly, for some reason, all these rich fat cats are putting profit above country. 
They don't care about your dad, you know, working a blue collar job. They don't care about, you know, you know, college kids, college tuition. As long as the colleges and the professors get their money, as long as the banks get their high interest rates, nobody cares. You know, so you know all the, all these wonderful rich people who are giving jobs to other countries instead of building up Detroit again. You know, they, oh yeah, they're nice people. Yeah, they're good Americans. Yeah, let, you know, let's help them out. What? What? And this isn't a foreign policy because you know this is just, uh, you know because this is this this just hit my head just now. I was thinking about something earlier during Doctor Hill. Like you know what? This is crap. Sorry, everybody. Every time every time you hear Obama say. Let let the rich pay their fair share. Well, then you know, let GE pay their fair share. Let Warren Buffett pay his fair share. Let Bill Gates, you know, all these people who find tax loopholes avoiding their fair share, you know, get rid of those loopholes, Mr. President. You know, tell the t you know when you're golfing with them, tell them build factories in Detroit, build factories in Cleveland, build factories all over the place. Stop giving them away to China. Stop giving away to Mexico. Stop giving away to South American countries. You know. So, you know, Obama is not the working class's friend at all. In fact, it's, he's, an, he, he's the enemy. He really is. Now, I'm not defending Republicans because Republicans are just as bad. Just as bad. They don't care about the working class at all. They really don't. You know, they care about, as long as their big donors give them big money, they'll turn the other way. That's a problem. It really is. We need a blue collar president, a truly blue collar president, who, when golfing with his friend at Martha's Vineyard, should tell them, "Hey, you know, I don't see any jobs in Detroit. You know, you know what? You know what's going on? You know, Detroit's a mess. No factories. Oh, well, 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 go go build an Xbox factory. You know, let Detroit build Xboxes. You know, stop stop going to Japan and China for that stuff. Let them build an Xbox in Detroit. Let them build a box, you know, in Cleveland, in the Midwest." You know, we and all these factory workers. Now you know, I've, I've, I'm assuming this. I have no research to back this up, but I'm assuming that all these people who are you know who are in their 40s working at McDonald's would be factory workers getting paid above minimum wage. You know, and we also have people my age have a mentality of being spoiled. We really do. People my age, and I'm guilty of it too. Believe me, I'm guilty. We are spoiled, you know. We don't pick, you know, you know we don't pick fruits and, uh, you know, and in, in the farms. We don't work in factories to pay for college, you know. You know, we we take it alone. You know, you know, most of some of us now a lot, a lot of people do get jobs to pay off college. A lot of people do, you know, but a good portion don't, you know. They don't. You know, McDonald's is not meant for 40 year olds. 40 year olds should be working in factories. 40 year olds should be doing something else, not McDonald's. McDonald's is for college people, college kids, you know, wanting money to, to, to take girls on dates, wanting money to pay for college, you know, wanting money for something. Not to live off of. McDonald's, you know, you don't go to McDonald's to, you know, get a job to live forever, you know. That's not part of McDonald's. Sorry. You know. So, all these big fat cats out there. Go to Detroit, please. Build a factory, you know. Stop getting in these tech loopholes. You know, tear, you know. And also put, give it a free trade. Get rid of it. Tax all the imports in, I mean, yeah, imports in the world. Tax them all. I want jobs in America. And the way you do that is by building factories. America is still an industrial nation. It's been standing on industry, and it will live on industry. And right now it is dying because all the industry is moving away. Now, whether that's to Obama or Bush or whoever, or Democrat or Republican, I don't care. I want it done solved. Clinton did nothing about it. Bush 1 did nothing about it. Bush 2 did nothing about it. And Obama is doing nothing about it. In fact, it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And the sooner you do something about it, the quicker unemployment will be down, the bigger the workforce will be, and the more money this country will have. This money run, this, I mean, this country runs on industry. And if you can't handle that, that truth, and want to sell out the politics, then shame on you. Okay? And if I see one more Democrat one time saying, let's let the, let the rich pay their fair share. Well, you know what? T tell all your donors, don't give money to me. Go put that money and build a factory. Go put that money and create more small business jobs. Alright? 
There is a war going on in this country. A war on the middle class of America. And both parties are not on their side. One party is for the extreme poor. And the other party is for the extreme rich. There is no middle ground looking at people like us. And they might talk a good game. But in the long run, they will always go back to their, you know, either side of the scale. There's nobody here. Now, if you're looking at this right now on the um, camera, you have one party all the way handing out free money for a government that, that, that the middle class taxpayers pay. We pay for these programs. And for the most part, the middle class is getting nothing. It's all going to the extreme poor. And for the Republicans, the rich are getting richer. Now, listen to this. And this is true. I don't care what anybody says. This is true. Under Obama and Bush, the rich have been getting richer and the poor have been getting poorer. And that's a fact. The workforce right now is shrinking. It's shrunk. If, if you compare the workforce in 2000 to the workforce today, it's smaller. Unemployment is not down because people are, getting, are going to work. It is going down because people have gave up. People are just taking the government handout. You know, and some people do need it. Some people do need government to help them out. But government should be used as a dead last resort. You know, you should go to your local church. You should go to your community and ask for help. You know, you should go to, you know, if you're going hungry, you know, then, you know, go, go to a local charity to help you out. Go to your community. Go to your neighbors. Don't go to daddy government first. The government is not your parent. The government is there to help you as a dead last resort. And that's the truth. Okay? And neither party has the guts to say it. But I just did. And that's the truth. If you can't handle it, then you know what? I'm sorry, but maybe you're in the wrong game. And maybe you listen to the wrong show. But you know what? That's the truth. Sorry. And on foreign policy, both parties are warmongers. I remember all the Democrats preaching, you know, you can't, you know, you know, all the protests, you know, you know, all the all the whining on the bush. And they were right. But now under Obama, you have a president who bombed seven countries. He took out our friends. Were they good people? No. But they were on our side nonetheless. You had presidents change sides. One day were for Iraq. One day were for Iran. One day were for somebody else. The other were for this. Pick a side, folks. Sorry, you know. You can't destroy, you know, if a country is stabilized, why go in it and destroy it? If a country is stabilized and fighting an enemy that you, that, an enemy or a group of people that you see are a threat to your nation, why are you going after them? It doesn't make any sense to me. Unless, you know, something else is happening. You know, something else behind the scenes. Obama is not the peacemaker he seems out to be. Obama is a warmonger. Just look at Libya. Just look at Egypt. Look at Syria. Or oh, actually, who provided the, the rebels with weapons who turned out to be ISIS? Obama and John McCain. Sound familiar? 08 campaign. Both candidates were warmongers. Both parties are warmongers. Sorry. I'm tired of people saying, oh, the Democrats are a party of peace. If they were really for peace, Gaddafi would still be in power. Mubarak would still be in power. Syria, Assad probably would have won. Probably, I'm not, I'm not sure on that one. But, you know, we have two presidents, and the two before them didn't help much either, who are fundamentally destroying the world, using America to do it, using our boys and our daughters to do it. Or I might, or I might, or, you know, or people my age, our brothers and sisters to do it. We are dying because this globalist U.S. view that the world should be completely democratized is a fantasy and people are dying and suffering for that cause. The end does not justify the means. It does not. And if you think it does, then you need help. Then you're dangerous. And I don't know anybody in the Republican Party Except for Rand Paul to a certain degree. And I definitely don't know anybody in the Democratic Party who's not a warmonger. Or, let me put it this way, big names in both parties who are not warmongers. This country is in trouble. This country needs a leader. Which party will deliver it? Well, it's not Obama, that's for sure. 
definitely not Secretary Clinton. That's for sure. It's definitely not Jeb Bush. It's definitely not Chris Christie. Who can lead us? I don't know. It's up for you to decide. It's up to you to do your homework and do and do the right thing and get educated and realize what's really going on in this country. Because I hate to be a uh, you know a conspiracy theorist, but this is what's happening in this country. We have no friends for the middle class. The middle class is at war, and it is losing so so badly. And neither neither party, no politician at the moment is fighting for us truly in Washington D.C. and in the Capitol. And that's a sad fact. I apologize for ruining your Wednesday morning. You know, I'm still in a reasonably good mood. Uh, I have a couple of minutes left in the show, so I would I would like to tell a joke if that's possible. Um, knock knock, and somebody will say who. So who? Boo, boo who? Don't cry. It's only a joke. What a wonderful joke, you know. I have all this gloom and gloom. We have a campaign, which I forgot to get to because you know I was so anticipated in Doctor Who lore. I forgot we had to do it, you know. But uh, but five minutes down, you know what? I just I just smashed both parties. But folks, in this race for governor, there is one candidate who stands above them all. Now, in 2012, I'm going to tell you who I voted for in major elections in the past. In 2012, I voted for Romney because his name was not Obama. And for, for mayor of New York City, I hated both. I did not vote for Joe Loder, and I did not vote for Bill de Blasio. I voted for somebody else because, you know, I didn't care. You know, he, he, whoever won was going to was gonna help destroy the city anyway. Or well, New York City. I'm in New Rochelle. Sorry. So, but for the first time in my life, in this election, I'm actually voting for somebody. Now, I'm not voting against Cuomo. I'm voting for Rob Astorino. I'm voting for him. Because he knows what it takes. He cut Westchester spending by 4%. Under his leadership, Westchester has the best credit rating in, uh, uh, the best credit rating county-wise. Under his leadership, 30,000 new jobs have been created. This man knows what it takes to fix a county, and which means that he must know how to fix the state. And he does know. He did it in Westchester, and he'll do it in New York. And friends... The Republican Party does have hope, and that hope is called Rob Astor right now. The way he's campaigning, going into all different areas, he, was, he, he even went to the Bronx. That is the way Republicans have to run campaigns to win. And he, I believe, is the future of the party. You, you could come back on this station right now, 20 years from now, and when he's you know, a, a high, well-known Republican countrywide, you'll be like, you know what? I was right. Nick DiCarlo was right. And you know what? I think it's possible. Now, will he win this campaign? He has a chance. Do I think he'll win? I don't know. You know, it's up for you to decide, you know. But I'm voting for him. And uh, next week, we I will dedicate a whole half hour to Rob Astor right now. I would have done it today. But um, we had a UK by-election to talk about. Oh, yeah. Please follow me on Twitter. I'm at Brovian93. That's B-R-O-V-I-A-N-9-3. B-R-O-V-I-A-N-9-3. Wait, B R O V I A N 93 on Twitter. On there, I post a ton of articles. I, I, you know, now and then post a comment too to express my opinion. But please follow me on there if you really want to know what's going on in the country. Cause I post some pretty good articles, both left and right. Both do a pretty good job, I think. And we'll see where it goes from there. Well, folks, that does it for me. I am out of here. As they say in a baseball game. Have a wonderful Wednesday. And thank you once again for listening to my show. And have a good day. Goodbye everybody.